So today we are talking about primaries. As Mike said, uh, I have uh, an interesting background in primaries. So on, on three occasions, uh, two times in, uh, Mike got it just a little bit wrong, but he got really close, which was two times in Virginia and one time in Florida. Uh, I have worked on congressional campaigns uh, for the United States House uh, in primary elections. And I have always thought it was interesting kind of uh, that process and how it ended up bringing me to a proof of money. So uh, I will ask you guys in the comments because there may be a lot of people, uh, but I will ask you guys to put it in the comments and ask you guys this question. What will your friends and family say the process for running for US Congress is like? Or what would you think it is like? You could also, Mike, if you, uh, if you think you can be cop and uh, let people discuss, what do you guys think? What, what do you think it's like? What are some words you describe? Pressure, expensive, predetermined, lots of money, Vicious. Vicious. I like that. That's very well said. Well, it's any more? Come on. You guys have to have an idea of what it's like. <laughs> Ooh, Ariel, sorry. Confusing. It can be intense. It's a lot of work. There's a lot of things you have to consider. You have to consider your voter base, the constituency. You have to you have to figure, well, how many votes do I need to win this? And there's a way to figure that out. You got to fundraise, whether it's by mail, by the internet, by uh, personally out, out reaching out to people where you go to meetings. There's a lot of different things involved. It's very, very involved. There's very little room for error because there's a lot of eyes on you. Not that I've made a horrible mistake. I'm shutting up now. <laughs> and you guys can all see my screen okay right now you see the slides so predetermined difficult right a lot of barriers a lot of great thank you guys so much that is exactly uh when i asked the ces uh staff i i went through this presentation with them and these are kind of the words that they came up with uh very similar to what you guys said opaque exclusive, right? Somebody put Byzantine, love that, right? Predetermined, smoke-filled back rooms. Is there nothing more <laughs> uh, like synonymous with, with kind of this process than smoke-filled back rooms than, and then, you know, deciding who's in charge, right? All of this uh, has a similar theme, which is kind of that someone is overseeing the process. Someone is, it's, it's somebody put rigged for, I assume they mean, you know, rigged for a candidate to become the nominee or uh, uh, that it takes a lot of money, right? And so we assume that there are some, there's somebody somewhere out there looking for the best candidates who is uh, trying to make sure that their party, usually we think it's party, somebody put party procedure, I love that uh, answer, that we usually we think it's a party and we usually think the party's out there trying to find the best candidates, trying to put their finger on the scale. And if they're not doing that, they're at least maybe putting their arm around somebody who potentially could hurt the brand, hurt the company, hurt the party and say, you're not gonna run. Definitely, that's how a lot of people think. So we wanted to test that. Um, in my experience from campaigning, uh, I had my view, but I wanted to see uh, how that turned out in, in actuality. So a lot of us, if we want to know how you become a United States member of Congress or how we have the Congress that we have, we should see where they all come from. Where do little congressmen and women, for lack of a better term, where do they come from? Where does it start? You know, if, if these are potentially people who are going to be part of our lives as Americans, as part of a democracy for, for uh, decades, what's their origin story? Why are they here and not somebody else? So that's the first question we hope to answer. The second is what numbers can we put around their experience, that origin experience, where everyone comes from? And 
what is that experience like and what is it has it changed is it getting better is it worse what is better what is worse um and we're going to answer this third question the fourth question that we're going to get way at the, the end but the third question is does the data suggest that someone is overseeing this process that it does seem like uh all the words you guys put out there byzantine and uh rigged and you know people putting the, the finger on the scale for their person is that true what about that is true and at the end, we're going to talk about why are there changes and, and if there are any, and what's the impact. So what do we do? Or where do we start? Well, at the beginning, all candidates, for the most part, uh, have to go through a primary. We're going to talk about that in a second. Uh, the primary is, uh, is the moment of maximum danger, is the way I like to say it. It's where uh, uh, in a lot of the country, 80% uh, of the country, according to the Cook Political Report, uh, a seat is safe for one party or another. Now, this is the 2020 uh, uh, House, or uh, sorry, the uh, 117th Congress, which is the current Congress. Obviously, the different uh, uh, Congress is coming in with uh, 22 midterms, but it's very unlikely that the, the being safe for one party or another is going to change that much. So 80% of seats are safe. So that one moment that can basically set somebody up for a lifetime of incumbency or, or being uh, locked out of that seat for probably decades is that very first primary. And so uh, and the, it, the other thing about primaries are primaries don't necessarily have to happen. They only happen uh, when one or more candidates file to run. So I think one of the first things we have to think about is, well, is that a lot of people or not? Does that happen often? Are there often primaries? Um, because that's the first step in the process that we can actually look at. So what do we do? We looked at the first primary of every single new member elected from 2009 to 2021. So remember, 2009 is the beginning of the 2010 cycle. And right now, 2021, it was the beginning of the 2022 cycle. In that time period, 485 new members joined the House. So these are all people who were not incumbents, either they beat an incumbent, which was very rare, or most, most, most likely they uh, ran in an open seat and won. And another reason why this research is really important is understanding where our members of Congress come from is currently 320 members of Congress are, were elected in the last decade. So understanding where they come from and what their experience is like may help us understand. That's about three quarters of the Congress. And then finally, we only cared about the primaries of the eventual winner. 80% of the nation, 80% of seats are safe. So if it's a safe Republican seat, it doesn't really matter how many people ran for the Democratic seat. Uh, what is really important is how many people ran when real power, the real chance of a seat in Congress was on the line. And we're going to talk a lot today about contested primaries. So what, it, what is a contested primary? So in our view, a contested primary was just a regular old primary, one where you know you have it in Virginia, we have it in the first week of June on even years, uh, where it's open to the public and it's run by the state, kind of your normal primary. Uh, uh, if you were nominated in a convention where, you know, uh, it was a party only and, and you weren't allowed, uh, people not necessarily, uh, uh, not a closed primary, uh, but a more of a caucus or a firehouse caucus or a firehouse primary where basically the party is deciding internally, we're going to put up one person and this is who it's going to be. That's a little different than the, the ones, the uh, open primaries run by the state and by, uh, so don't confuse a closed primary that is run through the state with kind of a, a, a local party caucus. Don't confuse that. So that's one thing to keep in mind as we go forward. So if, if the party put you up, whether you were an appointment or you won one of these little kind of off elections that weren't really um, part of the, of the state election process, we counted you as that was not really contested. You didn't really have to face the major electorate of the party of your state. And then again, if you if and also if 
you ran, but you were the only person who filed for your seat, you were also uncontested. Obviously, that's the most obvious one. So as we look at the numbers ahead, just keep in mind, uh, we're going to talk almost exclusively about the contested primaries. Um, uh, we, we counted the uh, people who were uncontested, but there's not a lot. And there's not a lot because of the 485 people who got elected since 2010, uh, 427 came from contested primaries. That is 88%. So you, another way of putting it, in this period, if you ran for Congress, you had a very small chance of going uncontested. I think that's one of the myths that we have in our hearts as Americans that you decide to run and on day one, it's me versus other party and some battle of ideas. No, that's one of the first things that should go by the wayside. The, the days of just kind of coasting into your party's uh, nomination are over. And on the other side, one of the questions is, um, is someone running this process? Well, if one of the indications is of someone running the process is keeping the field small for a favored person to win, doesn't look like they did a good job about that, if they did that at all. We're gonna talk about that. So only 58 out of 485 went uncontested. From now on, we're only gonna talk about those contested primaries because that's where everybody comes from, basically. So these primaries come in three flavors, nice and easy. Republican primaries, um, excuse me, the, and Democratic primaries pick the nominees for their party to go into the general election. Blanket primaries are the types of primaries you see often at municipal levels throughout the United States where it kind of doesn't, all the parties are together. Excuse me, sometimes blanket primaries have the party labels on there. Um, and sometimes, you know, and, and usually if someone doesn't get 50%, there's a runoff. That all being said, there were more Republican primaries over this time than, than the others. Why? Uh, one, you had the Tea Party wave in 2010. You had uh, big movements for the Republican Party in, in 2012 with new districts. Uh, and of course, the 2016 election also saw gains. In 2016 and 2014 saw gains for Republicans. And they also had a lot of open seats. So uh, it's one thing to keep in mind that these are the types of primaries we have. And interestingly, that there were more Republican primaries than anything else. And with the way the political environment is going into 2022, that should be about, uh, that should continue. So what are the big numbers that we got from this research? So we're, we're thinking, okay, I'm gonna run, I've already accepted, I'm gonna be in a primary. How many people are gonna be in that primary? Uh, it's gonna be you and five other people. So uh, I was trying to think of an analogy. If, uh, if you ever tried to get a bartender's attention, it's a lot harder when there's more people. It's very similar uh, when you're trying to get uh, voters uh, uh, attention. Uh, six candidates, that's a lot of candidates. Uh, I think in our minds, we often think, okay, maybe if there's primary, it's maybe two or three candidates. Uh, no, there are 2,570 candidates for 427 races. Uh, that, that is pretty, uh, pretty big. And not only is it pretty big, that number has gone up every single cycle since 2010. So in 2010, you had about five candidates uh, you had to deal with in a, in a contested primary. And then in, uh, by 2020, we were up to 7.3 candidates in a contested primary. So it's gone up every single year. And uh, think about it too, again, uh, obviously, you, uh, people come in integers, um, but just having that much more competition is, is happening. And we're going to talk about that more in a little bit. 150. These, this is the number of times there were more than seven candidates in a primary. Again, one of the questions here is, is someone, is it somebody's job to try to keep the process small, try to help favor people? this does not help that argument. It, again, if it happens 150 times over 10 years, if you're trying to keep it small and it, it blows up that big, um, you're doing a bad job. But that also has another, uh, another dimension. The more people that run, 
the less you need to win, the more that the first place goes down. So we roughly looked at all the contested primaries and we roughly chunked them up into thirds. So roughly, roughly a third of them had two to three candidates. And you can see the winner often had over 60%, nice and easy, right? You can see roughly a third had four to six. We're starting to get into that average of about six. You had drops pretty quickly. You could tell more people, uh, first place is going down. Seven or more, another third, 150 times. You could win a seat for Congress for life, essentially, with 34.6% of the vote. So one thing that this proves us is one, the vote splitting is happening. So vote splitting is not just an idea, it maybe happens pretty clearly over this decade. You had a lot of people, which happened a lot, there's gonna be a lot of vote splitting. And so talking about not winning by a lot, 52%, over half of everyone who won a primary and ended up in Congress received less than 45% of the vote in their election. Why that is bad on multiple reasons. One, remember this isn't just a general electorate. This is a primary electorate. So that's 45% of a primary electorate, which is a subset of a subset. So uh, the way I like to see it too, is that if I'm a party person, I may not be even getting the people that are, have broad support in a party because you're getting this really crazy vote splitting and people are going to Congress with this without any mandate, having, you know, looking like you squeeze through Congress uh, or your primary is a great way to uh, become a backbencher for a very long time. So I'll stop there for a second. Um, I'll open this up for the chat or I'll open it up for you guys to talk about. Um, do these numbers surprise you? What do you, what do you feel about? What, what do you think about when you see these numbers and, and why? Well, a couple of things. Uh, can you all, first of all, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, yeah. So one thing is, uh, I would like to see the, the pre-2010 numbers also, because I think a lot of this has to do with the shift in Citizens United uh, and sh uh, shift to internet uh, fundraising, because with that, in the past, you used to have to have bundlers to get like large numbers of donations from several different people. Uh, and if you, they thought you had a chance of losing, they wouldn't donate. But you know, in 2012, for example, when uh, Newt Gingrich ran for president, Sheldon Adelson gave him tens of millions of dollars, I think somewhere between 50 and 100 million dollars. So he just had to make one person happy and he could last the whole race if he wanted to. Uh, so I would really like to see the comparison with numbers before 2010, because then you could show that that's really that's there's been a systematic change in why um, this is occurring. A second thing notice is um, note is that uh, Roger Meyerson, uh, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics, uh, he's argued that we should use uh, approval voting primary. The main reason, the main place to use it is actually primary. So if you're ever looking for like, you know, talking points on that, that's one thing you use it. Roger Marson won the Nobel Prize says we should use approval voting for primaries. Uh, so, yeah. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah. So, so the process is changing, has changed. You know, we don't have the numbers before 2010. It was hard enough to get these, but, you know, we, I'm sure that'll be the next iteration. Norma says, it looks like it's not so hard to win a primary if you already have a, a solid group of supporters, right? It's not that hard, which is maybe surprising, right? One of the things we talked about is, or we assumed that it was kind of hard. Um, what other things? And it, Norma also says it, if it, it, it gets easier if, uh, if there's more than two people trying to win. Now, what else? Anyone else have any other thoughts? Do these numbers, not, not, not so much why this is happening, but what are your thoughts just thinking about these numbers right now? Kaya says, maybe these numbers explain why we didn't care so much about what's building in the past and why it may be such an issue now. Yeah, Kaya, that's a great point, right? We didn't really think about this before. Who, you know, I don't think vote splitting was on the top of people's minds with 35% to win, then a candidate can appeal with a vocal majority. So um, 
So I'm going to leave it right there and guys feel free to put that in the chat. But yeah, things have changed, right? We're, the, these numbers show that something is changing over time and we can either do, you know, accept that and kind of do something about it or we could just say, oh, well, that's not, you know, we can keep in mind how maybe things used to be uh, and that, but that's just not the case anymore. So we added one other dimension to this. And thank you everyone who in the chat. Seif Satanist. So sorry, there's lots of words here, but mostly what I want you to understand is for every seat, for every 485 of the seats, and at all 427 of the uh, contested elections, we added the Cook Political Report rating for each seat at the time. So at the, at the time of the election, if the Louisiana 5th Cook Political Report said it was solid Republican, that's that's what it was. And we care about that because if the fifth Louisiana district opens up and you live in that district, what is one of the first things you're going to do? You're going to see, okay, who's going to who's likely going to win? A Republican Democrat. Odds are you are a Republican or a Democrat. And you were either, oh, I, I'm not going to be a part of that, or oh, holy crap, this may be my one opportunity for life. And we wanted, we had an idea that, but we wanted to see. Does a seat safeness, so it's how solid it is for one party or another, impact the number of candidates? We saw pretty quickly uh, that the answer was, was very much yes. So uh, 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 Cook Political Report has eight uh, ratings. It goes from solid Democrat, likely Democrat, all the way to solid Republican. You can see that the toss-up seats, which are the seats most likely to flip for either party, have far less candidates than the solid seats. Probably because it's very nice to have to win only one seat, basically forever. Whereas the toss-up seat, uh, not only do you still have a primary, you know, the average is still 3.6. Not only do you still have a primary, you gotta defend that seat for two years, for every year of your life. Um, it's pretty clear that solid seats are attracting more people. And it also means that this is kind of where the action is. Oh, and we know that 80% of seats are safe. In this period, about 50% uh, of all the seats that came up were safe. So not only is, uh, are a lot of people running in these seats, these are maybe the most important seats that we don't pay any attention to, right? What are the ones we pay attention to? The toss up ones, all the ones that may flip, but it's in these other primaries, these solid primaries where uh, there are lots and pe lots of people running and that's having the effect you would assume. So as the seat gets more solid, the less votes about that you need to win. Um, and look at the, the pretty stark drop off uh, with the solid Republican primaries. And as we noticed earlier, uh, and as you can see here, there were far more of those than, than almost any other primary. Uh, lots of people are running, lots of people are splitting the vote, and lots of people are splitting the vote, especially in solid elections. And that has a big impact down the road. So is this just an aberration? Is this just 10 years of, of political struggle? Maybe, maybe. But in 2022, there were six contested races. You can see them here. 85 candidates ran for six seats in 2021. This is 2021. Uh, barely getting 38% of the vote was first place. These people will probably be in Congress for as long as they want. The very early indication from 2021 is that the uh, average number of votes went up every year, uh, or the average number of uh, candidates went up every year. We saw in the last slide that as candidates go up and they get more solid, votes needed to win goes down. But we also have another place we could look at which is Texas. 
Texas has the earliest primary in the country, which is in March. And in Texas, um, as many Texans, if they're watching, probably know, their filing period is over. So we know exactly how many people are going to run for Congress in their races in Texas with their new districts. So again, a lot of places we don't have the full congressional districts yet. 62 candidates are running for nine open seats. So 6.9 average. So right in line with our average and it's ticking up just a little bit more. So it's very likely that 2022 may have the worst vote splitting of any cycle previously before it, as it is very likely that we will get a host of solid seats with the new districts. So what have we learned from just our, these, uh, just these numbers, right? Nearly everybody comes from vote split primaries. This is just kind of a fact. You get elected in the 2010s uh, and probably going forward, you're gonna have a primary election and then may have some impact down the road. They're big. And like how Jeff said, you can win without a lot of people. You can win with 35% of the vote. That's of a, of a primary electorate. The bigger the primary, the less votes you need to win. The bar gets lowered with every new person. And it also seems with so many people running so often um, and continuing to do so, it does not seem anyone either seems to be able to or is even trying to dissuade candidates from running. And that's really important. So my question to you all, and now you guys can answer, why do you think more people are running? So Mahindra already mentioned, oops, um, you know, changes in kind of the political uh, fundraising environment. We're gonna talk about that. But what else? You guys have any other ideas why you think, um, why is this happening? Why are more people running? Well, I can, I can chime in for a minute. I, I know that, uh, that in many ways, this, is, this seems counterintuitive because you have a lot of organizations that are out there telling people, you know, if you want to make change in your community, run for office, run for something, get, get involved. And so there's this big push that that's the, the best way to get it done, but people don't think about the, uh, the potential negative impact on, on the political system with too many candidates running. I believe that it one factor could be that because of the internet, because of social media, more and more Americans are seeing negative impacts of what individuals in Congress and the Senate, whether it be in US Congress, US Senate and states, they're seeing the negative effects of policy uh, that will impact their lives directly. So um, it also could be that the process is being more available, um, what it takes to run, what the, the, from learning about, well, what do I need to do to run? Mm -hmm. What does it take? What do I have to do? When they're beginning to realize, well, I can do that. And because of social media, it's becoming, um, the, the issues are being more um, uh, put out there and, mm -hmm. The process is being learned by more and more people and they uh, feel like they can get involved. Great, thanks DK, anybody else? I'm seeing some other great things in the chat. Um, the, the, in, I, there was a case, I think it was in Florida where a candidate, there were two candidates running and I think it was the Republican, I'm not sure, uh, got a third person to run who had a similar name to the Democrat say. And so that like encouraged vote splitting that way because you didn't know who you were voting for. Yeah. And I think that was Celeste. Uh, Celeste. I think I, 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 I can't see, but I, I know the voice. It was. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, uh, Allison Sardinas, who also now works with us, lives in that district. <laughs> She saw that happen firsthand. They found uh, there was a Rodriguez running, so they found another Rodriguez. Uh, you know, there's a Jay Rodriguez running, so they found another one. So it was weaponized too, right? That was something we heard in St. Louis. And I had great, you guys have great things in the comments um, about 
you know, people feeling like they can do it. Average people are more involved and they seem like, uh, you know, they, uh, you know, average people are in Congress now. You know, I have average people in Congress. I can be in Congress. You know, we, uh, I think Norma had a really great one, which some people want to be rich, right? Some people want to be rich. They want to be on TV. Uh, so yeah. I, I put one in the chat as well. Um, I think what an interesting part of this is sort of the decay of uh, the power of the state parties uh, to be able to influence who runs uh, and who doesn't. Additionally, the graph that showed the competitiveness rating uh, connected to the number of candidates was particularly striking because the DCCC and the NRCC really do sort of flex their muscles to um, make sure that, that the most competitive candidates are the ones that, uh, that win those primaries, but they take a hands-off approach entirely with safe districts. Awesome. Yeah, Mike, you are jumping ahead to the next, <laughs> next section. It's almost like you, I promise I didn't tell Mike to say all those things. This is, this is my opinion, right? You know, I've, I've been out there. I mean, and Mike also has a really great perspective. He's worked on the inside on, on a lot of DC redistricting and things like that. But th these are kind of my opinions, uh, somewhat <laughs> or mostly educated from, from being there and seeing it. There used to be two groups largely that had tremendous power over your potential run. Uh, the state party, we're going to talk about them and the media. Both of those groups have seen tremendous amount of their power get diminished the last few years. But first, I want to talk about the state parties. State parties, they don't have that much power anymore. They used to tell people, excuse me, they used to track the cop a little bit. They used to gatekeep. We, you know, in political science, you really call it gatekeeping. They used to hold the reins of power. You, if you wanted to get into Congress and, and you know, 30, 40 years ago, you had to make the party happy. You had to be a great state party member. Um, not anymore. That uh, I'm sure you heard a lot when, uh, especially when Hillary Clinton was running, people said, it's her time. She's waited in line, right? There used to be kind of a line and they used to kind of be in charge of the line. And somebody said that before, you, you were right. Uh, parties also have wings. You know, uh, we definitely see in the Republicans, kind of the country club part of the uh, the party, and then we see a little bit more, you know, Trump uh, favoritist, um, Trump favoring parts of the party tend to be a little bit different, more more populist. Democrats have moderates and also their own wing of populist, and it comes really sticky for a prime, you know, uh, for a party to pick one side or another. They don't really do that anymore. Uh, and like how Mike said, the state parties, just like the national parties, ignore safe seats because it's a waste of time. It's a waste of money. You have campaigns are all about limited time, limited money and making everything go as far as possible. If you're trying to change the balance of power, the balance of power can be de determined by a few seats. That's where your money should go. So no one is paying attention to them. If you think the state party is paying attention to them, they're not either. Um, and as Mike said, the national arms pay if they, if they are, if a seat is even potentially close, that's when you see the DC people come in. So not only has the state power, uh, state parties completely kind of said, you know, we're not gonna be into this. These primaries are gonna get, cause us a lot of problems. Um, the state parties come in or the national parties come in and say, we're gonna run it. But as you can see, they probably have not done that good a job uh, uh, keeping the field clear for their candidates as well. So they, uh, there's a huge point here, which is, um, oh, and Mike said the run for something types of groups. I'm sure you've all kind of heard of that. You know, if you don't like how it is, get up and go run for something. Um, uh, you know, these are groups. Uh, there's groups like Vote Vets, Emily's List, Maggie's List, the collective, groups of, of, of people who are in the past burned by the old uh, get in line system that started their own group said, screw you, we're going to run our own people. We're going to find our own people. Um, so they go out and kind of independently third party go and try to find more people. 
And finally, you know, the parties don't give any money to primary candidates. Even in, even in really, uh, even if they really like somebody, that, this is what I've seen. They will never give you money. They will never, ever, 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 ever give you money while you're in a primary. I was in a primary in Florida where I was going to beat the guy uh, three to one, two to one. Uh, the party was not going to help us. They, they, they charged us for certain services. Um, often the parties charge you to use things that they would give to people for free. So they have zero leverage. They don't have access to the ballot. They don't have money to give you. They have nothing to stop you from running. Obviously, they try to recruit. I'm sure there are elements that try to recruit. But they do not have the power to stop anyone from running. Also, you know, we, one thing we don't talk about a lot is there's not a lot of information on these races, too. This is also probably why we don't think about it a lot, right? But because outlets, it's it's 2022, right? Everyone's every media person I know wants to try to preserve or at least stay away from anything that can make them look biased, right? And in a district that's heavily red or heavy blue, the right thing to do is to cover a primary because that's gonna be your person maybe forever. But there's a, there's a big kind of antipathy towards doing that. You don't want to, even if it's the right thing to, to, to do that. Um, and it becomes really hard when there's like 10 people running for, for uh, Congress. If you're, you know, if you maybe want to fo uh, feature somebody you're going to have nine other people say, feature me too. You gave this guy time. I want time too. Um, so most people, again, they throw their hands up and maybe get involved after the filing period. But again, at that point, you have the field. Those are everyone's going to be on the ballot. Again, the media too. They're like everybody else. They're, they only care about, is the seat going to be red or blue? They don't really care about the person involved unless that person tends to be a crazy person. But then that person is getting attention for, for all the wrong reasons as well. Um, they feel like most of us that there are, look at all these competitive seats in the country. Uh, that's what we should be focusing on. And so you don't, they're even less dissuaded, uh, they're even more dissuaded to, to wade into that. Again, it's sticky for them too. And what, if there is one myth that I hope dies, that I hope dies a painful death a thousand times over until it goes into the ground and never comes back again, is media outlets do not run polls for anything other than senator, governor, or president. They almost never will run a congressional poll uh, for a primary in, uh, especially if we're ways out, you know, especially if it's months away, and especially, especially if it's a safe seat. They don't care either. They know their readers don't care. I can't tell you how many times I got asked, well, what do the polls say? There are no polls. No one, there is no information. When there is no information, they can't say, well, these two folks are the real front runners. We're only gonna focus on them. They can't do that. So there's no information. You have all this, let's say you're in Louisiana, Louisiana's fifth district and it's a big Republican district, um, which I don't think it is, but let's say it is for, for argument. If it's a big Republican district, you don't see any news coverage about it. You can't really find out anything about the candidates, there's no polling to kind of dissuade you. There's nothing to dissuade you. And no one, it doesn't look like anyone's running away with it. Yeah, you're gonna throw your hat in. And there's one other, um, there's one other piece of this that I think you guys nailed on the head, which is times are different. It's easier. It, it at least seems easier to run for Congress for, for normal people, for average people. Um, doesn't cost a lot of money to start a website. Or you collect donations. You could do that in two hours and for not a lot of money. Um, a lot of this has been privatized. Mike used to work at one of these privatized places. You know, uh, I bought services from these privatized places. All these uh, voter databases and mapping software and PR and everything you, you possibly need. You don't need the parties at all. You could buy yourself and it ends up being cheaper most of the time. A lot of outsiders have won these two are probably the biggest in this uh, time frame, but there are multiple other ones, big upsets in this period. And they, what do they do? You see, okay, well, this person X is my hero. This is my, I, they did it. I was inspired. I watched the documentary about them. I'm going to run. Uh, and they have their, you know, and it seems to be on the conservative side, but also Democrats, they can use your own money. You know, it's a lot easier kind of use your own money to, 
to kind of track your own money and maybe on a little bit more of the progressive spectrum, you can use your own community action resources that, that you have developed over years. And one thing I think that goes really um, unnoticed is it only requires signatures to get on the ballot. Most people will sign your petition. If you say, hey, I'm running for this, you can sign my petition. A, a lot of people with enough time and enough friends can get on the ballot. It's not, it's not that hard. No, and finally, too, you know, if, if you live in a big, deep blue area, there's going to be a lot of deep, there's going to be a lot of blue mayors and state representatives and city council people, a lot of people who can make a viable argument for the seat. Um, and that's, you know, you have a lot of a deep bench, that's usually what people call it. Um, and again, these, they, they, they kind of feed into each other, right? So new candidates enter the mix. We're going to start on the right side because there's nobody to stop them. So they're excited. Vote splitting. People can see, oh, well, it's going to become more likely. It seems easier, right? I need less votes to win. I need less people. It's going to be more, more vote splitting. Uh, the seat looks more wide open because, you know, because there's so many people and there's little information to tell candidates. Maybe they should think twice. And the cycle continues. So it's interesting me watching primaries, especially in places like Pennsylvania, especially for that's for Senate, but it just seems like there's this bandwagon, right? And then once you get a few people, you're almost guaranteed to get everyone because everyone says, oh, well, why don't I go for it anyway? And uh, finally, this is the last piece. Um, oh, so I, what are, actually there's one last piece after this, but I want to ask you guys, what are you, who benefits? What are some of the things we, this makes you think about? You can put it in the chat too. First off, it's takeaways, it sounds pretty bad. And it seems like nobody's paying attention, right? Nobody's telling these guys or girls or anybody to, to run or to not run. It's nobody's mind in the shop. That's why the paper was called No One's Garden in the House. Nobody is, is there to, to find good people or to, or to stop maybe the most power hungry people or um, opportunists. Norma, that's great. Nice, nice and succinct. Anybody else? Opportunists. I love that one. Oops. Well, that makes it nice and easy. It's a great transition because Norma hit on that. Uh, opportunists, kind of, kind of extremism, right? There's, there's, there's a few things that are really bad about this. And I'm not saying necessarily vote splitting. If you're in vote splitting, this happens. I'm saying, uh, hear me out. Again, this is my opinion, so I can do what I want. Uh, because you have vote splitting, vote splitting is not like, you know, the campaigns don't know what happens. I think somebody said before, they brought up the Florida example, it's weaponized. Not only is it weaponized, it's, it is well known among campaigns. And especially with folks with, with main, uh, far from mainstream kind of, you know, anti-democratic ideas. They know that they can't win on both sides, on both sides of the spectrum. They know they can't win if it's a competitive toss-up seat, but they very, 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 very much know that these safe seats, they can win. And they can win uh, partly because uh, one, it's the only, but it's also for everyone, it's the only way they can win, right? With vote splitting and, and a lot of people uh, being a part of these big solid seat elections. They also don't, uh, because of this, because all you need to win over forever is a subset of a subset, so, you know, the primary subset and then the group of that primary. Uh, there was a study, I think it was by Yale that said, most people, most, uh, or sorry, most policies, how popular they are have absolutely no impact on whether they get done in Congress. And that's, that sounds right. You don't need to keep everyone happy. You don't even need to keep your own party happy. You need to keep the slice of people that got you in, and that's about it. And then, uh, you know, most par primaries, people agree. That's why they're primary. They're all part of the party, unless you're in a blanket primary. You're in a party because you agree. But it's, and, and, and in a situation where almost everyone agrees, the only people who are going to stand out, the only people who are going to get an edge 
are the people with the really toughest uh, positions on things. So candidates are the future. They're not going away. We need the best tool that improves situation now and in the future. So you know what my, my spiel is gonna be, All right? We're at the Center for Election Science. One of the reasons we support approval voting and one reason I think this is so important because a lot of people think about maybe other methods is approval voting works very good in this situation, works very well in a situation where there are lots of candidates. And what have we seen? Not only are there already a lot of candidates, there's probably gonna be a boatload more. We need a system that is already ready to handle six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 candidates. And that's, and that's why I feel so strong about approval voting. Uh, you know, the elephant in the room too is, you know, ranked choice voting. Ranked choice voting does one thing extremely, extremely well. It works very well when there's one, two, three, four candidates, maybe five. I think that's also one of the reasons they limit it to five. Yeah. In New York this last year, you could only vote for, for up to five, even though there's 13 candidates. That's, it does uh, elections with one, two, three, or four, or, five, or, or you know, up to four candidates pretty well. Then it starts to have issues with vote splitting and it, and it just gets murky. And as well as how people feel about democracy in this country in general, I think it's better that if we do have a change that it is also pretty, pretty clear. And then, you know, in St. Louis, there was a primary. This is for mayor in 2017. As you can see, uh, quite clearly, um, there was a lot of vote splitting, mostly between Black candidates. 68% of the city in this situation voted for uh, one of the, the Black candidates. But instead, uh, you know, the one white candidate won in, in a majority minority city, in a majority Black city. Uh, the point here is uh, this is a perfect example of everything we saw in the congressional primaries, right? You know, the uh, uh, folks winning with not a lot of support and ending up uh, governing to not lose one shred of support. And that's what it kind of seemed like when, uh, when Mayor Crewson was, was in charge. In 2020, obviously, uh, St. Louis moved to approval voting. And in 2021, they had their first approval voting election. Now, as you can see, there are actually two candidates from that exact same race, Tashara Jones and Lewis Reed. They both did much better. Now in this situation, the top two rent moved on. That's how they decided to do it in St. Louis. As you can tell, uh, there were not that many candidates as the last time. It was more of, a, we were in the teeth of, of the worst part of the pandemic too, but um, approval voting in St. Louis and the rest of the country is ready to handle all the candidates that are not gonna stop coming. For what it's worth, we do not want to stop any of these candidates running. Let that be heard loud and clear. We want more people to run. A lot of the people who are running are people who have been told no in the past by the parties, by the media, and have had these awful barriers put up. It's good that no one is, is gatekeeping them anymore. That is also, what also that means is if folks want to, you know, I always tell people, proof voting is never gonna make your particular candidate or cause win, but it's gonna be, uh, but moving to approve voting is gonna be one of the reasons, uh, it's gonna stop being a reason you lose. And so that's why it's really important to look at these elections, look at this data, look at this, um, not only in Congress, we are also seeing, this is the phenomenon with candidates also applies to the city, the city level, at the local level. We, that's a whole nother story. We looked at 150 cities and on average in those primaries for mayor, it was seven. So right on track with the congressional primaries. People are running. We gotta be ready. We gotta be ready for lots of people to run in the future. And uh, as, as we know with approval voting, not only is it great for all those candidates for the future, but it's also a great way of knowing which candidates have the broadest support. And we can finally close those loopholes that help some of the most, uh, you know, on the, on the uh, far ends of the spectrum, uh, how they win is with vote splitting and, and, and that can stop. And we can let that go and we can finally get some folks that even in our primaries represent the most of that electorate. I have a question. That is great because we're 
add the questions part. Oh, cool. Thank you, Chris. Um, my question is, when you talk about um, this idea of vote um, approval voting, is that the system where on the ballot you see five candidates, um, a number of candidates? In other words, is it's 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 this phrase of down ticket voting, banning, um, eliminating down ticket. Um, and if you could clear up this, this, this situation that I have in my mind where I, I heard this, it would, now is your, is your idea of vote splitting where you have a ballot where you, you don't choose just the one candidate, but with that candidate you're voting for like let's say a group of five. Okay, give me one second. I'm gonna pull up here. So I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be very, one of the reasons we, we support proof of voting is that most of the races in the country, so your primaries, your general elections, for mayor, for Congress, you end up with one winner, right? Uh, the, most elections in the country. And so that's why we look at approved voting. I think uh, what you're asking about is a little bit different from my pay grade. But what I um, wanted to show with this example is this is, you know, you can see, you know, just by the color of people's skin, where the where votes are split. And again, vote splitting is when similar candidates for any reason steal votes, steal, you know, votes from each other, right? So if Likely, if if it is very likely that if uh, the race is only down to two or three people, the results would be a lot different. You know, and I don't have a ton of time to go into how a lot of these candidates are different or are similar ideolog ideologically and how they're similar uh, different. That is being said, you can see we don't have a good picture of who won, or we know who won, but we don't kind of know why. And that's not great for anybody, including the person who won. And everyone else who lost, I tell you, I've been, I've lost elections. And the number one thing I looked at was who stole votes from me. I swear, if, if you had any support, if there was any presidential candidate you supported in 2016 or 2020 in the primaries, I bet you, you look, this person stole from this person, this person stole from this person, Warren and Bernie stole from each other, and they both did worse, right? So one of the reasons we moved to approval voting is on this ballot, there were these names. So there were these five names, but there were, were more. And it said vote for one. And that's with plurality voting. That's uh, vote splitting needs two things, plurality voting and lots of people, more than two people basically. Um, so what did we do? What do we, what do we work with the community to achieve was, um, oops. We, we just changed one of the rules, which is to vote for as many names as you approve of. So this is in 2021. And you can see there's four candidates and I showed you those results. You could vote for as many as you approve of. So it's essentially how much of the city, how much of this electorate approves of each person. So you basically have, uh, there's four candidates for mayor on the left. There's basically four individual elections where you say yes or no. And then uh, the, the end result was, uh, was this, where 57% of the city approved of, of uh, Tashara Jones and 46 approved of Kara Spencer. If you do the math, doesn't add up to 100 because you're not splitting a pie as much as you are individually gauging whether you have a favorable view of people. I think also, probably, oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, do you mind if I just... Uh pop in really quickly. I think there's a, um, there's a pretty good debate going on on the chat, um, typically uh, between uh, those who uh, generally favor ranked choice and those who are uh, open to the um, idea of approval voting. And so I, I did want to just kind of chime in quickly and, and give an easy uh, answer of why I personally uh, would support approval voting over ranked choice. And that comes down to the to the idea of with ranked choice voting, you still have just a single vote to give, right? So let's say that you have um, you go into the ballot box with a fairly strong opinion about 
one of the sort of less known candidates. So you place that person in first place and then you put second, third, fourth, what have you. Then during the tabulation, your first choice or maybe even your second choice as well, those don't meet the competitive, competitiveness threshold. So in a sense, those votes are thrown out. At the end of the day, the results from your ballot will say that you voted for that one person who was your third choice. And that's all that will really be recorded for uh, anyone to see. So it's sort of, it's a convoluted way of getting to a majority and presents uh, not really the full picture of where people's uh, support really, uh, really were um, the, the, the full spectrum of where those support, the, the support was in the electorate. So approval voting is the simplest way to get the actual most accurate uh, view of where an electorate really lies within, its, uh, within the candidates who are running. I don't know if anybody wants to uh, challenge that or or uh, or offer a thought on that. But it's, uh, I can offer a thought because, um, you know, there's a lot of voters out there who have gotten disengaged because of the way the two party system does not really represent the vast majority of uh, people who live in the U.S. And so, you know, they think they're doing great because they found the right polling place once every four years, but. Uh, they don't, you know, they'd have to look at the ballot and think, well, I don't know which one I want the most because I don't know anything about any of them. I don't really pay attention. So it would take a very long waiting lines if they're voting in person, and then a very long time to crunch the numbers to figure out who actually won. So that it's frustrating if it takes four or five days to find out who won. Um, I have another question, which is similar to the previous question. So the example that you showed uh, appeared to be a mayoral candidate um, race. Uh, was that the entirety of what did include uh, city council members? And I want to ask you a, a side question that applies with that. In our city, what we have is called district voting. And this is a prominent thing here in our state now, where a city council will vote for district voting, whereas before district voting, you have all voters, when they get their ballot, they have a choice of voting for anyone who's running for city council. Whereas district voting, you have the city divided up into districts and the um, wherever you live in the district, wherever you live in the city, in your district, you can only vote for those, can those candidates mm -hmm. who are running for your district. Now, is that what is considered a voter uh, approval voting? Or can you give me more examples of what, how um, approval voting would appear on a ballot, whether it would be congressional, um, Senate, uh, state Senate, um, uh, uh, assembly district, city council, congressional. Yeah, yeah, you got it. And let me guess, you live in California, is that right? Yes, I do. Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm very well aware of the districts uh, in California. So, uh, and that's a great question. So. The only thing we are suggesting to change is an approval validating the ballot looks exactly the same, except we changed the directions. So your city changed kind of the geographies covered, right? But that's all redistricting is in Congress too, right? This the zip code is now in this the fourth district versus the eighth district. All all the city did was move from at large where. Uh, I'm sure that you elected maybe multiple people at a time, uh, which is called block plurality voting, which is structurally very close to approved voting, uh, but not the same thing because you can still have vote splitting because you still have a limited amount of votes, but you're moving to districts. So in any situation, so I showed that mayoral, uh, that mayoral ballot, the ballot is exactly the same. And the rule, every other rule about the election is the same, right? So if if it's a closed primary for Republicans, only Republicans can vote in that primary, but, um, uh, and they're gonna elect one person, they're just gonna do it with approved voting, right? Uh, it can also work in general elections where if there's a Republican and Democrat, you know, one Republican, one Democrat, one independent, or if another iteration, maybe there's multiple of those, 
uh, but for sake of argument, we're going to say that there's, you know, uh, a Republican, Democrat, a Green, you know, uh, Libertarian. In that situation too, you can also still vote for as many as you like. Um, and again, it's just which one has uh, the highest approval, which one is liked by the most people. So um, that's a good question. It's easy to, uh, <laughs> it's tough, right? No, but that's also why we look at this part and why we look at approved voting and we look at plurality voting because we just say, that's the quickest thing we can change, right? That's the easiest thing we can change. And then one of the reasons the easiest to change uh, is, you know how I mentioned block plurality voting? Your machines, every machine in America already lets you fill out as many bubbles as you want. You can read multiple bubbles filled out. What it, uh, all that is done before an election is the supervisor says, okay, well, we're gonna elect three sanitation people, but one mayor, and they just tell the machines what, what is too many votes. Improved voting, there's no such thing as, you know, you filled out too many bubbles. Uh, so hopefully that answers a lot of your question and I'm happy to, uh, um, my email I'll share too, uh, DK. So you can also, if you have any more too, I wanna also give a few people yeah. some other questions. Right, yeah, Chris. I, I wanna, uh, yeah, I, just quick comment. I just wanna add, uh, one of several places have adopted and rescinded ranked choice, including uh, Sunnyvale, California, Boulder, Colorado, I think Cary, North Carolina, and some other places. And, but the biggest one is uh, Burlington, Vermont. And that's the biggest reason I think we should not ad adopt a, a ranked choice for single winner elections. Because basically what happens is that with ranked choice, it's possible for a candidate that is preferred by... So I'll give you the example of what happened in Vermont. So there was a candidate called Montrol that defeated all the other candidates one-on-one -on -one in terms of preferences. More voters preferred Montrol versus any mm -hmm. other candidate one-on-one. -on -one. But that candidate had less first place votes than two other candidates, so it got dropped. And people were upset about that, and so they rescinded a, a, a rank choice in Burlington, Vermont. And that's a very costly process, and I'd prefer, I don't think we'd want that. Uh, and so I think that, that's one of the reasons uh, we're, at least I'm strongly uh, in favor of approval voting. Thanks, Bendra. Yeah, I wanna, thank you. I wanna get some other questions here. I think uh, with Jason. Yeah, Chris, yeah. Yes, please. And, and Mike, is a question for you, Chris, and, and or Mike as well. So uh, I'm, I've seen a, a fair amount of elections and been frustrated by the lack of representation for myself, uh, it represented by the by the candidates and the and the the past the post system that we have. So I feel like I would take anything as an improvement. <laughs> right. um, I, by the way, I live in the state of Maryland. So if it was ranked choice voting, I don't think it's a, 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 a the right uh, the best one, but it'd be better than the the, the what we have. And so uh, approval would be even that better. But my question is, uh, there's there's other aspects about the voting system that uh, frankly are very, very frustrating. Um, as a computer person uh, all, my, all my life, uh, the fact that we have 50 different systems is amazing to me that it even exists because from a security standpoint, it is riddled with holes. So, right. so my question is, should the fight for uh, changing the voting scoring, right, hopefully centering on approval voting, be connected at all with um, the, the, we should have all paper ballots for, for our elections uh, of a standard format, and they should be, uh, we should have the Oregon style system of vote by mail for everybody in the United States. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, this is the one that really makes me crazy, is we should have not a, 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 a third parties that we hire to do um, the, the analysis of the votes after the fact, right? The, the polling and all that. But we right. should have a system in where these votes then are counted by machine, but then um, limited uh, by hand audits uh, as well. So it seems like there's like three or four like really right. key things that if we could do it at the minimum, at the end of the day, even if my candidate never won, I at least would know that my vote voice was recorded because it would be easy to verify that in, in a system that was a little bit more uh, right. secure and most importantly, uniform across this country. So I'd wow. like your, your thoughts and Mike as well, your thoughts on that. Yeah, Jason, great. I love that. <laughs> I love that. The, the judge, uh, you know, uh, so there's, there's a few questions in there. So I'm going to go over them real fast. One of them is, where does this fit in the pecking order of things I should care about? I care about, you know, uh, up to other things. So do I. 
you know, and, you know, a huge, uh, you could see everything I, I presented today and, and see, wow, a lot of those districts are safe. That shouldn't be the way we should fix gerrymandering, right? Uh, you know, that, that was also a very uh, logical thing you could land on. I, I always say approval voting, like we are and people, you, you know, we are not or people, right? <laughs> right? That's the number one thing about us is you can care about multiple things. You can like multiple things. You can have multiple things that you care about. People are deep. They don't always have a first choice. <laughs> so I get, you know, philosophical. They don't always have a first choice of thing that they, they care about. Approved voting needs to be in the mix. And one of the reasons we did this research is it needs to be in the mix because people don't notice the vote splitting. They don't notice that they're not, you know, the water is rising and it's getting up to the point of their nose. And one of the reasons that that's causing that is all of these candidates. There's all these candidates and that's not a bad thing, right? We, we want more representation. Uh, Norma said something earlier about, you know, the the not feeling represented by the two parties. Even the parties are not getting people who are representative of, of them if it's a slice of a slice. So, um, you know, I think we not to bail them out, but to also say uh, that piece. So we, uh, I will never tell anybody that my thing is more important than any other thing. I obviously feel strongly about it. The, way, the other way I want, I guess, folks to think about it is look at every, Thing you're mad at that you don't like about the system right everything you don't like about the system uh you know whether it's those those machines or those ballots or the safety as as urgent as they are they cost money and they take time right they cost money and they take time and if you ever want anything done politically time and money you know <laughs> a lot of pain financially or or making people wait is a great way to not make that happen. I, I hope that the, a lot of those things happen personally too. But one thing I really wanna point out is if there's one thing that I see out of this whole landscape that at least gets us something tomorrow, we gotta to do that. And that's proof of voting. And it also, but people aren't gonna get out of bed for a good idea. Just sounds like a good idea, right? Proof of voting is a good idea. Sure, we should do that. I like this the best. There is a problem. The problem is people are winning with 34% of the vote all the time. And they are making those federal choices for you on whether what next reforms get done. And, and I'm not putting one party on blast or the other, but a lot of people are just, you know, uh, want something done. And right now we're kind of really not incentivizing anyone, but the most uncompromising, you know, you either do everything at one time or you do nothing under any circumstances. And I think most people are, even in the parties, even across parties, are do something people. And, and that's how we feel about it. I think I might maybe feels very similarly that this is what we can get done. This is what we can get done tomorrow. And at least puts us, starts to put us on a path to changing those other things. Yeah. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but at least they'll have some different incentives and they'll feel some different pressure. If, uh, and I'll just add, um really quickly, I think one of the things that is best about approval voting and uh, the CES approach is the flexibility to, to how we're doing this. Um, if you look at Proposition D in St. Louis, which uh, brought in the approval voting, uh, uh, the use of approval voting, it was a broader good governance measure. And so one of the things that we do here is not just testing approval voting as the as a singular, uh, uh, as a singular reform, we're also doing testing on on how it how it uh, corresponds with other potential reforms. And so we are we are very focused on approval voting, but aware that people in communities all over America are uh, America are concerned about so many things about elections. So I I, I salute you, Jason, for for. Uh, having a lot of um, a lot of ideas. Thank you. Thank you for a great session. Yeah, thanks, Jason. And we got time for a few questions, but of course, we're, we're going to stick around. So um, I have a yeah. new question. Yeah, normal. Okay. You may have noticed that in Michigan, a citizen's ballot initiative statewide changed the state constitution 
so we could get rid of all these gerrymandered districts. And so they selected four Democrats, four Republicans, and four independents to recut up all the congressional districts and the presidential or, or the, the congressional districts too. So we're all trying to figure out what district are we in now and who's running in our district. And it's pretty confusing, but it means that we have a voice and it won't be a safe district for anybody because it's all new and it's pretty diverse because Lansing is in with a bunch of rural areas. So guess what? The member of Congress in that district is going to have to represent all the citizens and they have to learn how to get along together because there's diversity in every party. And instead of saying, I'm going to vote for so-and-so because I think he believes in fiscal policy responsibility, but there could be some Democrats who care about that, you know, and there mm -hmm. could be some Republicans who care about reproductive health. So the thing about approval voting is it lets a candidate run on their issues and it causes voters to pay attention to the issues and issues are what's going to bring us together because there's a lot of reasons for and against all the things that divide us and the two parties that say you got to be for corporations or you got to be for unions. Well, what if you don't know about that, you know, and what if you don't know which which candidate isn't a rhino, you know, Republican in name only or Democrat in name only and then vote against their party. Approval voting cuts through all that. It gets money out of politics because if you've got a website and some friends to do literature drops and you show up at the debates that the League of Women Voters hold, people will get it which things you stand for. And if you've got nine issues and this candidate has five of them and the next one only has one or two, well, you know, right. I'm not going to vote for somebody like I'm going to choose the one that will really represent me. And that right. will tell us what the people want. And both parties could ben that benefit from that instead of saying we know what's best. Right. Even if they yeah. never poll the voters and even yeah. if they never even tried to engage the voters. Because no, I, I serve homeless people, I serve people who've been criminalized. And believe me, those people see no reason whatsoever to vote. Right. Yes. I, I think that's very well said. I, th I think uh, you hit the nail on the head uh, on how approval voting changes some of the incentives that are involved in decision making for everyone involved. And this is what, part of the reason why I'm particularly attracted to approval voting, because by this simple reform, you're changing the equation for voters, for candidates, and for elected officials. For voters, they have more power to make your your uh, your voice known with your ballot. For the elected officials, they get a clearer sense of where public opinion really lies within their electorate. And then with candidates, they're incentivized to have to actually try to appeal to the broad spectrum of voters in their district, right. giving people more voice. And that's and less mudslinging from dark money. Exactly. <laughs> um, I have a one more, a, a few more questions that are oh. tightly fit together. Oh, hold on one, one second, DK. I wanted to make sure we got somebody. Um, <laughs> hang on. Uh, Mary Beth, I think you had a question. Yeah, I just, um, I was trying to understand um, how this works. And I, I've learned a little bit about ranked choice, but how that works with parties and them having their primaries. Um, does, does the success of approval voting mean that you have to get the parties to not have individual primaries? How does that work? That's a really good question. So, uh, and it's a little confusing because a lot of times when ranked choice voting is presented, right, there's, there, there, it's kind of like, there is no primary, everybody in one election, and then we're gonna run that race. That's what kind of people talk about. Approved voting, so in St. Louis, I showed that example. So the, in 2017, they had democratic primaries at the city level, which is rare. It doesn't really happen, right? And the city is 80% democratic. A Democrat was gonna win, it was useless, right? But all you needed to do was win that primary, just like all these congressional seats, right? You just had to win that primary and you're set for the four years. You got elected by a small group and, and now you're good. Um, well, what St. Louis decided to do is they decided to put everyone, regardless of party, in one primary. And they decided to have top two people move on. I think um, approved voting, I think personally works a little bit better when just one person wins, but you don't have to change. The parties don't need to get on board. And in fact, a lot of the political people hate this. They hate it. 
they they are trying to repeal it right now. They try to repeal it every day, everywhere. And in, in it's rid of their industry. Yeah. Yeah. It's it it's it takes power away from them because they secret is candidates. The dirtiest secret of all the campaigns is candidates and campaigns want to talk to the least amount of people possible. It saves money. It makes your life a lot easier, right? If you just have this little group and that's all you need, you're good. So one thing I like to point out is you can move to open primaries. That's a separate subject, but again, it gets a little tougher because people, primaries are in, um, again, uh, ensconced in law differently than voting methods, but we work with open primaries all the time. It's a national group that likes open primaries. One thing I like to point out is I hope down the road we have open primaries. In the meantime, and this is where Mike was saying about flexibility, if the Democrats in Michigan decided tomorrow that they wanted to pick their nominee using proof of voting, there is nothing, there's pretty much nothing to stop them. And if the Republicans of Florida wanted to do that, and actually I feel whatever party figures it out first that, oh wait, instead of sending someone that only 30% of the party supports, and now I have to spend the whole campaign trying to get, uh, you know, uh, if I'm Joe Biden, I got to get the Bernie wing on board and all these other things, right? Like keeping the party together. I can send in my party nominee who is the most approved, who maybe has 70% approval in my party. So it's my person who's got 70% approval versus somebody who's doing it the old way with, with only 20, you know, someone who got through a 25 person primary with, with 20% of vote. So you could do it with the party structure. I think that's going to be the fastest. And I think, I think you will see some results. I also think you could do it without open prim with open primaries. Um, and in a place like California, they basically have open primaries already. But the problem is without approval voting, you have a lot of people running, even in those open primaries. So you're just basically squishing the Republican and the Democratic primary together. So I didn't bring it up earlier, but uh, on average in a open primary, like in California and in Washington, they had about 8.8 .8, uh, candidates run on average. So you're still getting a bunch of people and you still have no clue whether the top two people are even the people, people you know, the top candidates people like the most. So um, I love the open primaries guys. I want them to succeed. I also like personally open primaries, but that doesn't fix the problem of a lot of candidates. And I think that's where I think approval voting and, and uh, open primaries actually work really well together. And I would not honestly suggest doing open primaries without approval voting. That's just my suggestion, but I like the open primaries guys, so I hope they, they succeed personally. But hopefully that answers your question. And, and DK, I wanted to make sure you got your question too. Um, yes, so two questions. Um, earlier you had mentioned that approval of voting to, it would eliminate those candidates who do not meet competitive standards. Um, so two questions on that. Um, who, uh, what are those competitive standards and that, 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 that would have to be met? What are they not? And um, what, um, how would approval voting be instituted by, by who, by what governmental agency um, process? So I think, I think when he mentioned um, com uh, competitive standards, basically what he means is to win an approval voting uh, election where vote splitting does not happen because it's, because it's, it doesn't work the same way. Essentially, standards would mean you would need a level of support to, uh, uh, to be able to win an election, right? So instead of the situations where you have seven candidates running for a specific seat and someone wins an election with 23% of the vote, in an approval voting election, that candidate will have to get near or above 50% approval. Is that right, Chris, or is there a better way you wanted to say that? Yeah, yeah, that, I, I, I didn't fully get the question, so I hope Mike got it. I, I will at least answer the second part of the question, which is who should do it? And maybe this is a good place to wrap up. And also, DK, if we don't answer your question, please reach out to us. Um, who does it? <laughs> you do it. 
We do it. <laughs> Activists, people on the ground do it. Uh, politicians, as, as Jason was saying, with all the issues that, that he cared about, that we all care about, they're not going to change how they got elected. In what world would they really change how they got elected? And be very careful of even candidates who say that they want to change the system of what they got elected. Because when they get in office, things end up being different. And in Fargo, North Dakota in 2018, and St. Louis, Missouri in 2020, and now Seattle this year, the approval voting uh, were, was, was implemented by uh, ballot measures, by the people coming together and organizing to, to collect signatures and get this on the ballot. Seattle is in the middle of that right now. They're collecting signatures right now. Uh, you could, you know, uh, you could lobby the government. I think it's, I don't think it's a good idea. I think the, the best thing and what we do is we organize. We, we set up chapter systems uh, and a chapter is just an opportunity to meet other people interested in proof of voting and to work towards action. Uh, we train our activists. We have, uh, last year we did a training with 10 activists and resulted in three statewide or uh, three organizations, two of them statewide. Uh, we are going out there and we're getting people involved to advocate for it by uh, signature gathering. And, you know, the only people who are going to be able to change the laws are, are us. And uh, because we wait for politicians, you're going to be waiting a really long time. So hopefully, DK, I answered your question, but I also want to maybe leave room for one more. And if, and if not, please email us. Uh, any other questions? Thank you for this. Was interesting. Lots of information. Hey, Chris. Before we before we go, is there do you, do you want to try to sum up what the what the three big takeaways that you want to get people to to remember as they leave? Yeah. Yes. Um, the, the big takeaways are, I had them all up before. Um, vote splitting in primaries with lots of candidates is happening. It's happening a lot. And as we saw, it's probably happening more every year. And this year, we'll probably even have more than we've ever had. Uh, that <laughs> takeaway number one, that is happening and is impacting who exactly makes it to Congress. Uh, Number two is, uh, you know, these safe seats are where nobody's paying attention. And uh, what has to change is that's obviously we would like those seats to be more competitive, but until they are, we need a reform that gets even those safe seats, even the electorate and those safe seats to uh, get what most of them want, right? That's not even what's happening right now. Is, you know, all the Republicans in the safe seat may not be getting what they want. Uh, they may be getting even slices and slices of people. And uh, the last thing is no one is stopping extreme folks from running. They can't. They can't stop unserious people from running. They can't stop people who want to be on TV from running. They can't stop. And, they, and, and it's not going to stop. And it kind of shouldn't stop. We want there to be a lot of people and we want there to be a lot of choices. We see that the main way you can actually achieve that is, is with approval voting, where it, it happens quicker and it happens clearer. And uh, you know whether it's an open primary or everything down the road, the candidates are coming. They're not going to stop. And if we want to get ahead of it and be ready for a future with lots of candidates, we, uh, we need to start changing the way we do things. And we suggest approval voting first. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, Mike, do you wanna lead us out? Yeah, no, uh, first, just thank you, Chris, for doing that. That was great. And I, and I wanna applaud all of the, mem uh, the audience members who have stayed and asked some fantastic questions. Um, if you do have follow-up questions, you can reach out to me at mike at electionscience.org or contact us to the website. We, we really, really did enjoy getting a chance to, uh, to chat with y'all. And on that note, I'll go ahead and shut it down. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>